Um, now on Saturday, the, um, the Guardian promised that this was going to be a series of Tet-like talks with flattened vowels. I'm afraid I haven't lived in God's own county long enough to deliver on that promise. I'm afraid I'm one of these uh, EU migrants. So the best I can do is some Louis van Gaal uh, vowels, but I hope you'll bear with me. Um, so a few years ago, I was lying on the sofa watching the news, and um, in a government-issued uh, um, report had just been published into the economic case for a high-speed rail link between London and the North. And um, the Secretary of State for Transport was interviewed, and one of the things, among the things he said, was uh, the quote that, uh, that you see here. And when I was listening to this, I thought, well, that doesn't sound very confident if you're about to spend 42 billion pounds. Um, and it piqued my interest. I've been working on related problems uh, to this for a while. And I started looking at the report itself. And um, it was very interesting to see how the government comes up with these kind of, um, with these kind of figures. I've, I thought that the report was extremely engineering heavy and very economics light. So to give you a very quick overview of how the government came to this idea that HS2 would be a great idea, and I focus here, by the way, only on the first phase. So that's the phase of building between London and Birmingham. Yeah, the rest uh, I, I thought was too complicated already, so <laughs> I stuck with this. The way the government does this is as follows. They say, well, it's going to take us about eight years to build this rail line from London to, um, to Birmingham, and after that, in today's money, we're going to get out of this 28 billion pounds. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about where these figures come from. I take them at face value. Okay? There's a lot you can say about them, of course. But let's assume that this is right. Um, and it will cost us 15.7 billion pounds to actually construct this line. And what you then do is you take the benefits, this 28 billion, you divide it by uh, the 15.65, and you say, well, that gives you a benefit to cost ratio, BCR, of about 1.8. Okay. Um, actually, yeah, of course, we have to take into account the fact that, well, we're not entirely sure whether in eight years' time this is really going to be worth 28 billion. It might be a bit more, it might be a bit less, but um, they did some. So they made some assumptions and they said, well, we're, we're quite sure with 95% probability that this benefit to cost ratio will be at least 1.31. So that's taking into account some uncertainty. Uh, and then the government has these sort of benchmarks that says, well, if a project has a benefit to cost ratio below one, so if the benefits are actually lower than the costs, well, this is poor value for money. If it's between one and one and a half, well, it's low value for money. Between one and a half and two, it's medium. And in this case, HS2 falls in the medium category. So we're pretty happy to go along, and we should be investing in this thing. And the literature in which I uh, work, to which I contribute, Typically, um, we recognize that actually you should be much more upfront about these uncertainties. Just saying, oh, in eight years' time, we're going to get out of a lifetime of this railway line 28 billion, uh, plus or minus a bit. Well, that plus or minus a bit, maybe you should be a bit more specific about how you, how you get this. And one of the things that is very um, obvious is that, or should be obvious, is that these thresholds that you choose beyond which you say a project is medium value or low value for money have to be different for different projects. If your construction time is four years and it's, um, there's not much uncertainty surrounding it, well, if you have a BCR of about 1.5, maybe that's good enough. But something that takes eight years to build, well, all sorts of things can happen in eight years. So maybe you should take into account the fact that the benefits could actually be a lot lower than what you're predicting. So your safety margin, if your time horizon is long, if uncertainty is large, your safety margin should be bigger. So why you should use exactly the same number 1.5 for every project that you might conceive is not entirely clear. OK, so I have been working on some idea where I wanted to incorporate in this kind of thinking another source of uncertainty that is not taken into account typically in, this kind of, uh, in these kind of valuations, which is that construction itself 
is uncertain. You never know whether it's really going to be eight years. It might be nine years. Now, what is the consequence of construction lasting for nine years rather than eight? That means you incur your costs for a year longer. Also, your benefits in today's money are worth less because you're going to get them in nine years rather than in eight years' time. So your benefits are going down. Your costs are going up. Well, when you divide these two numbers, your benefit-to-cost ratio is going to go down. So my suspicion was that if you actually make this a bit more explicit, then you will find that actually the threshold beyond which you should call a project value for money should probably go up. And the current estimate of what this benefit-to-cost ratio is should probably go down. Now, I have to say here as a side remark that I didn't actually, I didn't get any research grants to do this, this research. It was very much, a, a lot of it was done lying on the sofa. Um, it's, it's partly because it takes a long time to get research funds. Yeah, it takes months to write a proposal and then the procedures. And actually for this kind of work you often don't get it because of course, the research councils, they want to know whether they're going to get value for money. So the first thing they say is, show us first that you can do it. So that's what this is about. Fortunately, the university allows me to do this kind of work, so thank you very much. Um, and um, that's the, what this problem really is about. What is the impact of potential construction delays on um, the value of a project like HS2? Now let's first think about profitability and uncertainty around profits. So if we think about, we are at time zero today, what would be the profitability of an HS2 line? Well, it could be like this green line. Yeah, it sort of wobbles about a bit because it depends on passenger numbers, which are uncertain and might change over time. Uh, running costs of this thing, uh, the economic climate, all sorts of things impact that we can't perfectly foresee, right? So profitability into the future could be this green line, yeah, or it could be this red line. It could be something completely different. So what you want to do is you want to try and get some handle mathematically on how you could model these kind of things. And one of the easiest ways to do it is actually to say, well, we cannot predict the future, but what we can come up with is a best guess. Well, that could be that red line. But we take into account that the further we project into the future, the more variability there can be or will be around this best case or this, this best guess. So there's, there should be some bounds around this, right? So when you model this mathematically, uh, what I do in the paper is that I show that this can all be done quite, um, quite uh, neatly and it, it all comes to solutions, so that's good. Um, and the construction uncertainty here, of course, is added to this. So while we are constructing, potential profitability hobbles along and it changes over time. And what happens to construction? Well, we start in London, we start building this track, and it goes well until we reach, for example, this point here. And that's where, uh, I don't know, we hit a badger colony or some Roman remains. And that's when the whole thing stops, because the archaeologists have to come in, and they start digging around, and that takes time, and it takes time. And then, okay, we can start again, and at some stage we reach Birmingham. The thing about these delays is that you don't know in advance when they are going to be how often they're going to be, and how important, how, how big they are going to be. Of course, you can have some thoughts about this. You can say, well, on average, it's going to happen once a year. Yeah? So taking that into account, you can apply this to the government's own figures. Now, I have to say here, that's what I tried to do. Of course, that was very difficult to get the right information from the government's report, because the report was not designed to be analyzed in this particular way. So I had to guesstimate quite a bit. But my um, conclusion was pretty much as follows. This uh, benefit to cost ratio that um, uh, was estimated to be 1.8, uh, I actually think 0.99 is a much better guess. And this threshold of 1.5 before you call something value for money, I think that, um, well, 6.6 .6 sounds actually more like it. Um, so a bit higher, uh, and, that's and that's not even taking shocks into account. So that's taking into account that you're not actually going to hit Roman remains. Yeah, if you expect that once on average, once a year, you might hit a badger colony, 
and that slows you down, then actually the current estimate of your benefit to cost ratio should be lower. It should be something like 0.87. In that case, actually, your expected construction time is not going to be eight years at all. It's going to be more like nine years. Your cost overrun is going to be 12%, roughly speaking. So the changes are quite dramatic. Now, of course, I'm an economist, yeah, so I never make a, a firm statement. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on the one hand, this is yeah, it's this. On the other hand, um, this is, of course, a back-of-the-envelope calculation. Now you can go to a research council and say, this kind of stuff works. You can do these kind of things. Now let's look at this in much greater detail, get the right figures, and see what these thresholds really should be. Um, a nice thing about this kind of approach, actually, is that you can also say, well, what is the probability, even if it's not value for money now, what is the probability that in the next 10 years this is going to be a value for money project? Uh, that's the, the last two figures there on the right. Uh, not very high, 1.37%. So uh, uh, I, I think maybe the political case for HS2 might be stronger than the economic case, that's uh, to put it mildly. Um, okay. Now, of course, as I said, you can now go away and ask for research funding, but actually I'm much more in interested in applying these kind of ideas to new problems. Uh, so here is a list of potential problems to which you can apply these kind of, uh, this kind of methodology. Uh, one that I uh, uh, added uh, last week is, for example, how much should you spend on flood defenses? I think uh, might be a question that people in York might be interested in. Um, now, the mathematics that I use, it's just one sort of side remark that I want to make. The mathematics that I use is actually quite well known, but unfortunately not among civil servants in the Department for Transport. It's well known and heavily used in the financial sector, and all these quants working in the city, thinking about derivatives and pricing of derivatives, etc., they use all this stuff. And unfortunately, then, the people who use this analysis often don't. And we've seen in 2008 what happens if, uh, if you do that with a bit too much uh, gusto. Um, so when I think about, well, someone asked me, why is this not really used and shouldn't it be used? And my thoughts were, well, I suppose, yes, of course, you should, because at least you're more honest in this way of valuation that there are uncertainties that you should take into account. Of course, it's not a perfect model. Nothing ever is. But it's a step in the right direction. On the other hand, if it turns into a button in an Excel spreadsheet and it's going to be used by people who don't really know how to interpret the numbers, you might end up in a worse situation where you actually started. So I suppose the last thing I would like to say is that one of the big things about improving the evidence base on which these kind of decisions, we're talking about 40 billion pounds here, uh, are taken is partly in education. Our students should be asking of us to teach them these kind of things. And of course, in a market-driven education system, that's the way it should go. The students should demand that they want to learn more mathematics to deal with these kind of things. Um, so I'll await their demands. <laughs> um, and on that thought, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>